All right, how's everybody doing? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. It is Wednesday, January 2nd, 2019. 2019 is here and we made it. Um, so hope everybody's doing well today. Happy New Year to everybody. We know Kwanzaa just ended, but the seven principles of Kwanzaa, then Guzu Saba, we carry those with us 365 days a year, and we practice them 365 days a year, okay? Not just the seven days of Kwanzaa. So I wanted to talk about this uh, story that I saw um, back around December 19th or so but uh, I did not get a chance to talk about it. And this also deals with economic empowerment and cooperative economics, Ujama, uh, the fourth principle of Kwanzaa, uh, cooperative economics. And for cooperative economics to take place, we have to cooperate. For cooperative economics to take place, African-Americans have to <laughs> cooperate, right? So uh, I wanna talk about this story about a really, really uh, powerful story about uh, Rich Lou Dennis, Rich Lou Dennis, who is the uh, co-founder of uh, Sundial Brands and, uh, and uh, Shea Moisture. And he is the uh, owner of Essence Magazine. We know it was announced um, uh, January 3rd, 2017, I think is when the press release went out that he was buying uh, Essence Magazine from uh, Time Inc. Okay, so we know Essence Magazine is once again owned by uh, African people, African Americans. Okay, even though he's uh, of Liberian descent, he's still a brother. All right, and, and they're doing some great work. Okay, so African American business owners, hey, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you, we'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network and on the audio podcast of our shows, all right? So, atlantablackstar.com, news1.com, uh, a number of different publications has a really good article uh, going back to December 19th, um, dealing with Shea Moisture's founder wants to transform Madam C.J. Walker's old home into an incubator for black women, okay? And this deals with uh, Rich Lou Dennis purchasing the 34 room, uh, 20,000 uh, square foot mansion uh, that was owned by Madam C.J. Walker. It's actually built for uh, Madam C.J. Walker, okay? And uh, this is in New York, okay? Uh, and what he wants to do is to turn this into a business incubator for women of color, especially African American women. Okay, so the uh, different uh, outlets, AtlantaBlackStar.com and News One, they picked up this story from uh, the Low HUD, L O H U D, which is a USA Today uh, publication. And they have an article Billionaire Rich Lou Dennis of Shea Moisture Essence shares uh, vision for Irvington Mansion. Okay, Billionaire Rich Lou Dennis of Shea Moisture Essence. Essence Magazine shares vision for Irvington Mansion. And when they say billionaire, they're probably referring to the value of his businesses. The, the, well, actually the, um, the revenue uh, of the business uh, and possibly the value uh, when they say billionaire. Okay, but uh, he said, Rich Lou Dennis said, uh, when people think of women's empowerment and economic inclusion, they should think of Irvington. All right. So this mansion was built 100 years ago by uh, Bertner Tandy, who was a very well-known um, African-American uh, architect. OK. And this mansion also oftentimes served as a meeting place for those uh, artists and well-known people during the Harlem Renaissance also. So a century after it was built, the nation's first self-made female millionaire, and Irvington Mansion has been sold to another self-made mogul. And Madam C.J. Walker, we're going to talk some about the history of Madam C.J. Walker, as well as uh, Annie Turnbull Malone, okay? Now, Annie Turnbull Malone is not as well known as Madam C.J. Walker. 
Andy Turnbull Malone, Turnbull Malone was the mentor to Madam C.J. Walker. And she hired Sarah Breedlove, who was a washerwoman from um, uh, St. Louis. She hired her in 1905 and taught her the uh, uh, black hair care industry, taught her the business, okay? Hired her as a saleswoman. Andy Turnbull Malone was the one who created basically the black hair care industry. Sarah Breedlove worked for her. Sarah Breedlove went on to become known as Madam C.J. Walker. Okay, so when they say, and this is why I have to do some historical corrections here, when they say that Madam C.J. Walker was the first self-made uh, female millionaire, probably not. It was probably Annie Turnbull Malone because that's who, Sarah, that's who Madam C.J. Walker worked for before she set up her own uh, business. And I, I deal with that history in uh, the lecture series. I do Great African Women in History, The Mothers of Civilization. Great African Women in History, The Mothers of Civilization, which is available at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. Annie Turnbull Malone is less well known than um, Madam C.J. Walker, probably because uh, she lost some of her fortune because of back taxes, ex, uh, the excise tax uh, back around the 1920s or so that dealt with taxes on luxury items. So she lost some of her fortune. Um, so she, so she's prob this probably has something to do with why she's not as well known as uh, Madam C.J. Walker, okay? All right, everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. And then uh, African-American business owners, hey, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Email us at customerservice at africanhistorynetwork.com. Customerservice at africanhistorynetwork.com to find out how you can advertise with the African History Network on the audio podcast of our radio shows and our broadcasts. And um, we can help you get new customers. And then also we have a 48-hour sale going on right now, uh, the Black Panther 8 Digital Download Bundle Pack. Uh, which is regularly eighty dollars is on sale. Thirty dollars includes uh, uh, eight of my uh, lectures, three dealing with the film Black Panther, but also my Kwanzaa presentation uh, dealing with from Kwanzaa to Wakanda, reconnecting African Americans to African culture for self empowerment. You'll get that as well, so you get nine presentations, um, and that's on sale thirty dollars at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We just posted the link here. All right. AtlantaBlackStar.com, uh, for, so you can do more research, has an article, 10 Unknown Facts About Annie Malone. 10 Unknown Facts About Annie Malone, the first black female millionaire. And they get it, they get it correct. So in some of this history, this is, the, this is not to take anything away from Madam C.J. Walker. What she did was fantastic, and she took things to new heights, right? But we have to give, we have to give credit to uh, Annie Turnbull Malone. This is a picture of her here, okay, a famous picture of her. And uh, this is an article from uh, July 6, 2015 from AtlantaBlackStar.com. 10 unknown facts about Annie Malone, the first black uh, female millionaire in uh, the U.S. And she was probably the first self-made female millionaire because if you say that madam cj walker was the first self-made female millionaire and madam cj walker worked for annie malone then annie malone was probably the first self-made female millionaire because it was annie malone who created the black hair care industry okay um so everyone has heard and they talk about how everyone has heard uh of oprah uh, and Madam C.J. Walker, but have you heard of Annie Malone? She was the first black female millionaire with a reported $14 million in assets generated from her beauty and cosmetic uh, company in 1920, okay? And then they break down some facts um, about her, okay? All right, so we'll talk some more about her in just a minute. Okay, how's everybody doing? All right, so let's look at this. Let's go back to this article from the Low Hood. Uh, okay, here we go. Okay, so the um, the Villa Loraro uh, Mansion, L E W A R O, uh, that's there in um, New York, that was built for uh, 
um, Madam C.J. Walker was built in 1918, 1918. So 1918 is the same year that World War I ends. Madam C.J. Walker unfortunately passes away the next year in 1919. 1919 was the year the Red Summers whipped as well, where you had over 25 major race rides in this country, okay? And Madam C.J. Walker was the daughter of newly freed slaves. So when we deal with this history, right, she was born in 1867. Madam C.J. Walker was born to former slaves. She was born two years after slavery ended. So when we look at some things that we were able to accomplish in the early 1900s, all right, is mind boggling and it serves as a uh, template. It serves as a, a, a lesson and a inspiration for what we can achieve today when we learn those lessons and understand how they did it, okay? And this is in spite of white supremacy and racism. Yes, white supremacy and racism exists, but what do we do to fight against it, all right? So, um, but it was uh, announced that uh, Rich Lou Dennis has uh, re recently purchased uh, the mansion, and he is an African immigrant whose company Sundial Brands is currently valued at $1 billion. He's from Liberia, okay? He's from Liberia. Now, uh, both Rich Lou Dennis and Madam C.J. Walker made their fortunes in natural hair care products catering primarily to African-American women. Uh, so this article is from December 19th, and uh, they talk about how on Monday at a meeting of the Irvington Village Board of Trustees, the 49-year-old Rich, uh, Rich Lou Dennis, dressed down in jogger pants and a patterned scarf, greeted members of the board, residents, and even journalists with a hug. Um, he was in he was in front of the uh, in front of the board to discuss his plans for the 34 room 20,000 square foot mansion on North Broadway. OK. And like I said, it was built in 1918. Uh, Madam, Madam C.J. Walker's Dream of Dreams home was designed by Vertner Tandy, V.E.R.T.N.E.R., who was the first African-American architect registered in the state of New York. Now, the plans include a think tank aimed at fostering entrepreneurship among women, particularly, especially women of color. And, and this is through, they're going to do this through distance learning and on-site retreats, okay? So he wants to turn this into an incubator for uh, business women, especially African-American business women, okay, and have all types of training uh, for them, et cetera. So the plans include a, a think, tank, think tank aimed at fostering entrepreneurship among women, particularly uh, women of color. He said, quote, when people think of women's empowerment and economic inclusion, they should think of Irvington. Okay, he's talking about the uh, the Irvington mansion that he wants to transform into this think tank and this incubator. Um, now, he moved to the U.S. from uh, the West African nation of Liberia to attend Babson, Babson College on a scholarship, B-A-B-S-O-N, all right? And there's a whole history of African people engaged in commerce, African people engaged in cooperative economics and economic empowerment. That's a whole history of that. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately for African Americans, we largely do not understand that history. Okay, and we've been taught to adopt white business principles and white capitalism, European business principles, European capitalism, things like this, as a solution for the lack of economic empowerment for African Americans. But that largely does not benefit the collective. It benefits individuals. It largely does not benefit the village. It largely does not benefit the collective. So what we have to do is study a history of cooperative economics in this country, the co-ops. When I did my presentation um, for the uh, People's Coalition on uh, Saturday, December, was that 29th? Uh, Saturday, December 29th uh, at Birch Warehouse dealing with um, 
cooperative economics. I talked about some of the history of African-American co-ops, you know, the Colored Merchants Association, the Colored Farmer Union, and how we use this, this type of uh, economic engagement that was coming from taking principles from Africa, especially West Africa, and we were using this to fight against white supremacy and racism. And if we look at, you know, I talked about the book uh, by Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard, Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard, called Collective Courage, Collective Courage, A History of African American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice. Collective Courage, A History of African American Cooperative Thought uh, and A History of, of African American Cooperative economic thought and practice. And this book documents numerous examples of us engaging in cooperative economics uh, with the co-ops, whether it's the Free African Society, the Color Merchants Association, and these were different uh, co-ops that were created to empower us economically, to help pay for people's funerals, their burial calls, uh, to provide uh, legal aid to provide things like um, health care, uh, to help start businesses, all different types of things like this. We have a rich history of this, okay? And I interviewed Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard back about 2014, because her book came out in 2014. And this is a piece of history that's not talked about. And she said, that, you know, there's a good article uh, about her and her book. Uh, from newsone.com, June 30th, 2014, called Stop Saying Black People Don't Support Each Other Economically. Stop Saying Black People Don't Support Each Other Economically. And um, in the article, they talk about how um, she said, quote, in most, in most places I've spoken, people think that we did not engage in cooperative economics. OK, and she is a uh, professor and uh, she's a political economist and professor of community justice and social economic development at John Jay College in New York, in New York City. She said, my challenge was to prove that we did, that we did engage in cooperative economics. OK, the name of the book, once again, is called Collective Courage, a history of African-American cooperative economic thought and practice, all right? And I interviewed the sister back in 2014 because she was speaking here in Detroit. I didn't get a chance to go meet her, but I did interview her. And uh, I mean, the interview was fantastic. And we, uh, I think we still have it archived uh, at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Um, but she said her challenge was to prove that we did engage in this. So she, so she, figured that she would spend just a few years researching uh, African-American co-ops and digging up whatever she could. It, it, it ended up taking her 15, about 15 years to write this book, okay? Because what happened was she said she was met with a history that spanned uh, Black Americans' period of enslavement to the present day and support for cooperatives from almost every major black political leader along the way, all right? So almost every African-American political leader in our history supported co-ops and in many cases were involved in co-ops. But this is a part of history, this is a part of our history that is largely left out, okay? So she talked about how uh, a lot of times we'll know about the political struggles and we know about the civil rights movement and things like this, but we don't understand the role that co-ops play in how the civil rights leaders, how African-American political leaders were, um, were, were, were supportive of the co-ops. She said, quote, the black cooperative, and we'll post a link to this article here uh, on the thread of the broadcast also, because you, you have to check this out because a people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. A people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. And this is one of the ways that we, this is one of the ways that we did this to meet the needs of the community 
and fight against white supremacy and racism. But that history has been largely lost. And what happened was many African Americans went to white business schools at universities and learned white business principles, learned European business principles, European models of business, and then tried to employ that in the African African American community. And that largely does not work. Okay. I went to Wayne State's business school. I graduated my degrees in business administration with a major in marketing. Most of my professors at Wayne State's business school right here in Detroit, Wayne State University, most of my professors were white, okay? We did not learn this history in the business school. We're learning white principles, white business principles, okay? And largely, even though I did take two entrepreneurship classes in the business school, um, the classes that we took were not geared towards African Americans. They were geared towards white people. Okay, this is nothing against them. What I'm saying is we have to understand that our history is different. So when we talk about um when we talk about Jamaicans coming to this country, Haitians coming to this country, things like this, and they become many of them become very successful economically because of their businesses, right? Where they're operating based upon a cultural context, okay, that we in this country, African Americans, have largely lost because we have a we have to a lesser extent an understanding of our history than they do. So when uh, Nigerians can come here and, uh, and brothers and sisters from West Africa and, and things like this, and they could become very successful. They're operating based upon a better understanding of their history and culture and different practices of economic empowerment that we have largely lost. We have been taught to emulate white business models, and that largely does not work for us. OK, so we have to understand our history and understand the difference between these business models. But Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhar in the article from NewsOne.com said, quote, the black cooperative movement has always been parallel to the black liberation and civil rights movement. And uh, I'll pull up the um, uh, PowerPoint presentation I did also for, um, for Kwanzaa dealing with Ujima Cooperative Economics, because I talked about this in the presentation. She said, the Black Cooperative Movement has, uh, has, always been, has always been parallel to the Black Liberation and Civil Rights Movement, okay? So she's saying, when you had the Black Liberation and Civil Rights Movement, there was always an economic empowerment component with that. But the economic empowerment component has largely not been talked. We, we, we were just taught about the marching and the protesting and the sit-ins and things like this. We would not talk about the economic empowerment component. All right, let's try to bring this uh, up so you can see this here. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in. And, and, we, and see, once again, this goes back to me saying a people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. So, when, so instead of looking at other people's business models, other ethnic groups, other races' business models of business and how they became successful, first of all, we need to look at our own. And we're not doing this. This is where your history and culture comes in. Uh, and, and the foundation is African history and culture, which gives us our VIPs, gives us our values, our interests, and our principles, as Dr. Leonard Jeffries and Professor James Small correctly teach us. That not only influences your economic empowerment, it influences how you engage in economic empowerment. What model do you use, okay? How do you engage in business? So Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard said, the black cooperative movement has always been parallel to the black liberation and civil rights movement. She said, we've mostly heard about the political side of the movement, but you can't name a major political leader that did not point to the cooperatives as a pathway to freedom. When we talk about a pathway to freedom, we're talking about economic freedom, economic empowerment as a foundation. We're talking about Ujama, cooperative economics. Once again, as I said, this, the seven days of Kwanzaa are not designed to just celebrate for seven days. The, the Nguzu Saba, the seven principles of Kwanzaa, is not designed to just celebrate for seven days. It's designed to 
practice these principles 365 days a year. This is why the people, and see, what I find interesting is how people who want to criticize this aspect of Kwanzaa or criticize Dr. Mawulana Karinga, things like this, right? Those very same people are not embracing the seven principles of Kwanzaa and talking about practice them, practicing them seven days, uh, I mean, practicing them 365 days a year. They're not talking about that. See, they just want, they just want to disrupt any type of unity. Watch that. They just want to disrupt any type of unity. They want to disrupt any type of economic empowerment and just point the finger and criticize. Kwanzaa is not about a personality. Kwanzaa is about African people. Kwanzaa is not about honoring personalities. Kwanzaa is about empowering African people. So watch those who are on social media negatively speaking about Kwanzaa. Okay? All right. Let's continue here. And uh, we'll post the link here also. Uh, African American business owners, uh, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Okay. And then also email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We can let you know how you can advertise your business on the audio podcast of our radio show. Each episode reaches thousands of um, listeners across the country and outside of the country. And our current promotion. Um, uh, your first month is 50% off. Your second month is free. We had that promotion going on uh, till uh, January 4th, Friday, January 4th, 2019. All right. And uh, if you like this type of information, you can also donate to the African History Network, uh, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, or go to AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, click on the yellow donate button. Okay. If you don't have a PayPal account. You can do that. And that helps us to the sell of the DVDs, the digital downloads, all that, uh, the donation that, that helps us to keep doing the research, finance the African History Network show, keep broadcast and pay the bills, et cetera. All right, let's continue here. And then we posted the uh, name of the article again, and it has um, the name of Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimhart's book in there. Okay, uh, Collective Courage. Uh, Collective Courage, A History of African American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice. Uh, so we'll post that link again also. There was also another article from Vice.com. It was an interview with her. Uh, this is from August 9th, 2016. It's called How Black Co-ops Can Fight Institutional Racism. How Black Co-ops Can Fight Institutional Racism. We talked with Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard, an expert on cooperative economics, about the ways that Blacks can gain, join together, through a capitalistic enterprise and create social change. Okay, so check that out also from vice.com. So all this history is there, right? And see, when, when I was in business school, I, at the same time, I'm studying African history and African American history, right? So, and I'm studying Dr. Claude Anderson, you know, going back to 94, when Black Labor White Wealth came out. I'm studying Dr. Claude Anderson, I'm studying Dr. Jawanza Kanjufu, uh, his book, uh, Black Economics. You know, I'm studying African history, African American history. At the same time, I'm in business school and learning this from white business professors. Now, there was one um, entrepreneurship class that I took, taught by uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bill Picard, William Picard, and he's well known across the country, um, a pioneer in the um, auto automotive industry, um, and uh, also, James Robinson uh, taught the class as well, who's one, who one of my mentors, James Robinson, here in Detroit. And that one was geared toward teaching entrepreneurship from an African-American perspective and to um, empower African-American entrepreneurs, right? But even in that class, you know, we talked some about Black Wall Street, things like that. Even in that class, the real history of African-American co-ops was not talked about, even in that class, okay? All right, so we have to, when we engage in economics, right, we have to do that from a uh, African, African-American cultural perspective and understand that history. Okay, let's continue here. All right, and very quickly here, if we look at um, what Dr. W.B. Du Bois said, because there's a good article from, uh, 
atlantablackstar.com dealing with uh, five historical examples of uh, cooperative economics, okay? Uh, so Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimhard talked about every major black political figure, you know, supported uh, co-ops, right? Let's look at what Dr. W.B. Du Bois said. And we know that Marcus Garvey was heavy into co-ops also with the UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association, okay? Dr. W.B. Du Bois said, there exists today a chance for blacks to organize a cooperative state within their own group, a cooperative state within their own group by letting Negro farmers feed Negro artisans and Negro technicians guide black home industries and black thinkers plan this integration of cooperation while black artists dramatize and beautify the struggle economic independence can be achieved economic independence can be achieved but it's operating throughout the cooperatives for cooperatives to work you have to cooperate okay this is ujima cooperative economics okay to doubt that this is possible is to doubt the essential humanity and the quality of brains of black people this is dr w b Du Bois, um 1935 okay all right so let's continue here. So these are things that we have to practice year round. This is a good lesson to take into the one nine, right? In the 2019. Okay, so let's go back to the article from, uh, from Low Hud. Billionaire Rich Lou Dennis of Shea Moisture Essence shares vision of Pervington Mansion. So, uh, so, so he said, uh, the idea we would create a think tank where we would have some of uh, some of the uh, best minds in the country thinking about entrepreneurs and the challenges of entrepreneurship for women of color, for women and women of color. Okay, now for Rich Lou Dennis, the first order of business is to restore the estate to its original glory. OK, he said once that is done, he is proposing using the state to hold small retreats for graduates of a program developed by the members of the think tank with technology. It would be accessible all over the world. OK, so this is something really, really, um, you know, it's just something really spectacular that he um, is engaging in, engaging in. Now, though it is though it's in the very initial stages of curriculum development rich lou dennis clarified the quote-unquote graduates would comprise about 10 to 12 women from across the globe every six months who had gone through the uh quote-unquote distance learning course distance learning course he said we would be able to have small classes for women who have graduated through these programs to come in and spend an afternoon with each other for peer-to-peer -peer learning, okay? Peer-to-peer -peer learning. So his humble beginnings mirror that of Madam C.J. Walker, right? Uh, and we know Madam C.J. Walker was born to parents who were former slaves. She was born in 1867, two years after slavery ended. Now, when Rich Lou Dennis graduated from Babson uh, University in 1991, his native Liberia was engulfed in a full-blown civil war. And so instead of returning home, he began making and selling natural skin and hair care products for African American women, African American women. And this is a segment that uh, uh, Rich Dennis believed was largely ignored by mass market companies. Now, uh, Dennis, his mother, Mary Dennis, and his college roommate, Naima Tubman, Tubman, made the products out of their queen's apartment, okay? This, was, this started out as a home-based business. His, his business is valued at $1 billion today. It started out as a home-based business, okay? So the inspiration uh, was the natural recipes recipes used by his grandmother sophie right in liberia rich lou dennis said quote my grandmother made different hair and skin preps and sold it in the village market in liberia and i grew up seeing her do that he said i started making african black soap 
made with plant ash, A-S-H, and shea products. The same things my grandmother was making and selling, end quote. So when, when, once again, when we study our history, going back to Africa, not just West Africa, you see this across Africa. We, we had a history of entrepreneurship. We had a history of making products, selling them, growing products, selling them in the African marketplace. That's our history. So when I, when I hear people say, well, Arabs and Chaldeans, you know, and Asians, they own stores in our community because they have a history of that. What the hell do you think our history was? We don't understand our history enough to understand we have a history of entrepreneurship. We have a history of economic empowerment and cooperative economics. Now, his grandmother was widowed at the age of 19. And she had to start supporting herself and contribute to the family. Understanding what grandmother Sophie went through, S-O-F-I, opened Rich Lou Dennis' eyes to the many struggles and challenges female entrepreneurs face. Okay? So he is um, at least second generation, well, really third generation business because his, his mother's involved in the business. Okay? And his grandmother, so he's like uh, a third generation entrepreneur, I should say. Okay, third generation entrepreneur. So he said that led him to develop his company's philosophy of community commerce, community commerce. Quote, part of this business journey was that, they, that we wanted to make sure our products come from women like my grandmother who were systematically excluded from economic activity and faced many barriers, not unlike women all around the world today, end quote. He went on to say, the idea is that we would invest our profits back in the communities that supported us. Today, we have 30,000 women in cooperatives in Africa who have now risen above poverty. See, the, see, we have a whole history of Ujamaa cooperative economics, okay? And he's talking about this right here. He said, today we have 30,000 women in cooperatives in Africa who have now risen above poverty, end quote. Now, reading about Madam C.J. Walker as a teenager was hugely inspiring for Rich Lou Dennis and for everyone in his family. Now, he grew up in Liberia in West Africa, and he's reading about this sister, Madam C.J. Walker, and what she's doing. And, the, uh, and she dies in 1919, 1927, the Walker, um, the Walker Institute, I think it was called the Walker Institute, is, 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 is finally completed, right? And this was like a, a multi-story level building that was like Black Wall Street. They had all different types of, of, of businesses. In, in there, they, there was a theater in there. Uh, there was a, a barbershop and, and beauty salon. Uh, you had uh, all different types of doctor's offices and attorney's offices, things like this, in this multi-story building that was completed in 1927. That's separate from the mansion where she lived, okay? He's reading about her philanthropy, things like this. Madam C.J. Walker, this sister was a bad sister, born two years after slavery ended, okay? All right, so he and his he and his family in Liberia are reading about Madam C.J. Walker. Okay, so he said, re uh, reading about Madam C.J. Walker as a teenager was hugely inspiring to Rich uh, Rich Lou Dennis and for everyone in his family. Dennis said this. Uh, Dennis said uh, uh, it, so in 2013. He bought the Madam C.J. Walker trademark because in 2016 he released a um, a line of um, products. Um, in 2016, his Sundial Brands launched a hair care hair care line called Madam C.J. Walker Beauty and Culture. Okay, and he bought the Madam C.J. Walker brand in uh, 2013. Okay. And also AtlantaBlackStar.com talks about that and also this article as well. The company launched a new hair care line, the Madam C.J. Walker Beauty Culture, in 2016, sold exclusively at uh, Sephora, S-E-P-H-O-R-A. Now, Rich Dennis has come a long way 
from the days when he was hawking his wares on the streets of Harlem, New York, at the corner of 125th Street and 5th Avenue. So I've been to 125th Street and 5th Avenue. I've been to the, um, the uh, it was the Black Arts Theater, I think it is there. And I've been to 125th and Lennox. I had to go to 125th and Lennox because that was the name of um, one of Gil Scott Heron's albums. Right. And Gil Scott Heron is a hero of mine. So I had when the first time I went to Harlem, you know, I had to go to 125th and Lennox. So his sundial brands, famous for uh, brands such as Shea Moisture, has become one of the largest natural uh, beauty business businesses in the country. In 20, uh, 2017, uh, the company was acquired by Unile uh, Unilever for an estimated one point six billion dollars. At Unilever, uh, where he remains as CEO of Sundial Brands, Rich Lou Dennis launched the New Voices Fund, the New Voices Fund. Now, this is a $100 million fund that will invest in businesses owned and managed by women of color, especially African-American women. So when he, when he sold the business to Unilever, he caught a lot of backlash, right? And then right after that, so and right after that it was sold, then the hundred million dollar fund was launched. Then he bought Essence magazine. So now Essence is not owned by Time Inc. anymore, it's owned by Rich Lou Dennis. Okay. Um Atlantablackstar.com has an article from July 12, 2018. Shea Moisture does its part to support black women entrepreneurs by launching $100 million fund, okay? Uh, and it talks about in here, about six months ago, we announced that we were launching the New Voices Fund, New Voices Fund, uh, Rich Lou Dennis said during a press conference at Essence Festival. He said, quote, I'm proud to say that we got we get to officially launch the $100 million New Voices Fund for women of color entrepreneurs. Over the past six months, we've already either invested in or committed to over $30 million in black women entrepreneurs. So this brother is doing some fantastic things. Okay, this brother's doing some fantastic things. According to the fund's website, the initiative is meant to, quote, support startups, establish businesses. And uh, let me see here. I think we have this pulled up. Uh, okay. Yeah, according to the fund's website, the initiative is meant to support startups, establish businesses, and uh, community-based entrepreneurs. The goal is to deliver unprecedented impact to our communities by ensuring new voices of entrepreneurship learn, grow, and thrive for generations to come, end quote, okay? For those interested in applying, the application is now live on the New Voices website. Now, I don't know if there's a deadline. We'll post this article here. I don't know when the deadline is, but uh, those watching, check this out. This is something you can take advantage of. African-American women especially, this is something you can take advantage of. Brothers watching, you have a sister who is an entrepreneur, get this information to her, okay? And uh, let's pull this up here. Let's see if, uh, let's pull up the application. See if there's a deadline or what's going on. Newvoicesfund.com, New Voices Business Profile, okay? So it looks like it's still open. So we'll post the link here also as well. Newvoicesfund.com, newvoicesfund.com. Click on application. We'll post the link here to the application also. Okay, check, check, check this out. All right, this could be very beneficial for you. Okay, so this is what this brother is doing. All right. All right, so let's go back to the article from the low HUD. We'll come to some of your comments here. All right, now who here is an African-American business owner? All right, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com because we can get your 30-second um, and 60-second commercial. Uh, we can put that into the podcast of our show from Sunday and some of the broadcasts we're doing this week, all right? And what we do is if you don't have a commercial, we can record one for you or you can send us one. 
You can write a script out for us. We can record one for you. We put your 30 second and 60 second commercial into the audio podcast of our radio show, the African History Network show that we do Sunday nights. And some of the broadcasts we do throughout the week like this one, okay? And each, and we're on six different podcast platforms. We're on iTunes, we're on CastBox, Blog Talk Radio, FM Player, uh, TuneIn. And each episode, we reach thousands of listeners all across the country, all right? Uh, our current promotion, buy one month, get uh, the first month is 50% off, second month is free. First month is 50% off, second month is free. It's very affordable. And uh, this promotion is running to January 4th, 2019. We can get you up and running today. Email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com uh, for more information. All right, so um, he named his, uh, Rich Lou Dennis named his, uh, the company Shea Moisture. Um, he named that after the uh, shea butter that his grandmother used to sell in Liberia. There was an article from uh, lifehacker.com, lifehacker.com. Uh, I'm Rich Lou Dennis, owner of Essence and Sundial Brands, and this is how I work. This is from August 29th, 2018. And it talks about how, um, how he runs a family business. He, his mother, and his sister named their beauty brand Shea Moisture after the shea butter products that his grandmother made and sold in West Africa. This is where the name Shea Moisture comes from. This is where the name of that brand comes from. It goes back to his grandmother once again. And Rich Lou built his company into Sundial Brands, acquired in 2017 by Unilever, uh, which sells hair and skin products primarily designed for African-American women. Okay? So uh, check that out also. This was an interview with him as well. All right? So these, you know, so when we teach entrepreneurship for African-Americans, right? We have to use, it's all right to study people, you know, Andrew Carnegie and um, Jeff Bezos at Amazon. It's all right to study them, but we really have to study African Americans and African entrepreneurs because their history is much closer to ours. Their circumstances and conditions are much closer to ours. Okay, so we have to use those as models. You know, I, I do a uh, uh, if you get my DVD lecture, 13 Forms of Wealth, 13 Forms of Wealth, which deals with keys to economic empowerment for African-American entrepreneurs. I deal with 13 different types of wealth, but I also deal with um, examples of successful African-American entrepreneurs, historical examples, right? And I deal with, you know, how were they able to do it? I talk about people like Madam C.J. Walker or John Merrick. Of, uh, who founded North Carolina, who co-founded the North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, who was a former slave, John Merrick, okay? I mean, that brother has a fascinating story. Okay, so who do we have here? We're gonna continue here in just a minute. So how y'all like this type of information? Are you learning anything? How y'all like this type of information? We have Lonnie, we have uh, Guy, he's at Kwanzaa 365, Howard, I appreciate the knowledge, absolutely. All right. So let's continue here. Okay, so uh, let's see where I leave off here. All right. So this is the article once again from uh, Low HUD, uh, the USA Today publication. All right, so reading about Madam C.J. Walker as a teenager was hugely inspiring for him and for everyone in his family, okay? And so he bought, in 2013, he bought the Madam C.J. Walker trademark. The company launched a new hair care line uh, called the Madam C.J. Walker Beauty uh, Culture in 2016. Now, Dennis has come a long way from the days when he was having his wares, uh, hawking his wares or selling his wares on the street of Harlem at the corner of 125th, uh, 125th Street and 5th Avenue. His Sundial Brands, famous for brands such as Shea Moisture, has become one of the largest uh, natural beauty businesses in the country. 
Okay. Now, earlier in uh, 2018, he also acquired Essence Communications. That press release went out January 3rd, um, 2018, that he acquired Essence Communications, all right? And this was, this was huge news. All the media outlets had stories about this, especially African-American uh, media outlets. And uh, in Essence Communications, Inc., uh, owns Essence Magazine, as well as the annual Essence Music Festival. He bought this from Time, Inc. So for the uh, for the Villa Loraro, which is um, Madam C.J. Walker's former mansion, this it's a full circle moment. The home designed, uh, the home has been des designated as a national historic landmark in 1976, a national historic landmark in 1976 for its architectural significance. And it was designated a national treasure by the National Trust uh, for Historic Preservation in 2014 in honor of Madam C.J. Walker's legacy. So at the meeting with the uh, Irvington board uh, where Rich Lou Dennis spoke, okay, there in New York, um, at the at the meeting, uh, Irvington Mayor Brian Smith and the trustees were all in agreement that the initiative would be great for Irvington. They said they were eager to see Rich Lou Dennis plans for the property, which would require a special use permit from the village, a special use permit from the village. OK. And let me see here. All right. Um, quote, we can celebrate not only the building, but the life and legacy of Madam C.J. Walker, said um, uh, Mayor Smith. This is not just about African-American history, but American history, period. Now, Madam C.J. Walker's great-great-granddaughter, her name is Alila Bundles, Alila Bundles, and she's the author of On Her Own Ground, On on her own ground, the life and times of Madam C.J. Walker. She said, uh, and she now serves as a brand historian for uh, the Madam C.J. Walker line at Sundial Brands. And she said uh, she was thrilled by the new ownership. Quote, the Dennis family wants to make sure that Madam C.J. Walker's legacy continues not only through the hair care products, but also through the beautiful home that was intended by Madam C.J. Walker as a place that would inspire others, okay? They embody, it, they, they embody it themselves and they understand why it is important for other people to be able to share the vibrations that come from that house, end quote, all right? And I've talked to... Um, Alita, I follow Alita. We follow each other on Facebook, so I've talked to her before. That's the great granddaughter of Madam C.J. Walker. All right, so um, I was reading that this was coming at a uh, uh, he buying the mansion is coming at a good time because of um, some changes that have, have been taking place with the zoning there. OK, uh, and let me let me try to find that information here. People think, uh, yeah. I'm trying to see which article talked about the zoning. Just a second. OK, uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com in their article, Shea Moisture's founder wants to transform Madam C.J. Walker's old home into an incubator for black women entrepreneurs. Uh, let's see here, pull this up. It talks about how the newspaper, um, The Low Hood, reported that Dennis, that Rich Lou Dennis move, his purchase, could not have come at a better time. As quote, Irvington has only just passed a new zoning law that permits adaptive reuse of registered historical buildings for non-residential purposes, including schools, tours, and certain kinds of events, end quote. 
the goal of the new law was to help ease the burden on homeowners by giving them some relief from the high upkeep and tax expenses that often come with owning such properties, okay? Now, once again, this is an example of how politics impacts every aspect of our lives. This is why when people think the solution to our problems is just strictly economics and doesn't also involve politics, they don't understand either one of them. Because here you have politics helping to create economic opportunities because of the changes in the zoning laws. And in every major city, there's a zoning board. The zoning board impacts the businesses. It determines what, what types of businesses go where. It determines you can't have certain types of businesses within a certain proximity of a church or a school, okay? It, 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 and, and it impacts things like this right here. This was the zoning board. Um, Irvington has, has only just passed a new zoning law that permits adaptive reuse of registered historical buildings for non-residential purposes, including schools, tours, and certain kinds of events, all right? So we need to get more African-Americans and right-thinking African-Americans on the zoning boards, okay? The, those Usually the zoning boards, they're either elected or appointed. We need to get more African-Americans on the zoning boards. We need to find out more about the zoning boards in our cities. The politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement, okay? Who owns the eyewear line for Essence? I'm not sure. In that, in that case, I'm not sure if Essence owns it or if Essence just licenses their name. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure on that. Don't know about that, okay? All right. Okay, so African-American business owners, hey, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. We can get you up and running today. We can take your 30 second and 60 second commercial that you send us or we record for you at no additional charge. We can put into the audio podcast of our uh, radio show, the African History Network show and um, our other broadcasts we do throughout the week, some of those. And each episode, we reach thousands of people across the country. We can help you gain uh, new potential customers as well. And we also have a 48-hour sale going on the Black Panther 8-digital uh, download bundle pack. The Black Panther 8-digital download bundle pack is on sale $30. So 48-hour sale. It's an $80 value on sale, $30. And it includes a ninth presentation. Um, the one I did, the Kwanzaa presentation I did December 27th at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History 2018, uh, from Kwanzaa to Wakanda, reconnecting African Americans to African culture for self-empowerment. From Kwanzaa to Re Wakanda, reconnecting African Americans to African culture for self-empowerment, okay? Uh, so all that's available at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and we'll post the link here again as well, at 48-hour sale. Uh, and that you get the um, eight digital download bundle pack. You watch from around the world. These are digital downloads. The links links expire in um, seven days. But it's a uh, these are digital downloads, so you can download them and keep the presentations. Okay, it includes three of my lectures dealing with the film Black Panther. Uh, it also includes uh, uh, the Light of Ancient Egypt awakens the African mind to economic empowerment. Uh, it includes, let's see what else, Human Guinea Pigs, the history of the Tuskegee experiment of untreated syphilis on the Negro male. Because contrary to popular belief, right, um, there's a lot of misinformation about the Tuskegee experiment. Number one, all the men in the experiment did not have syphilis. Um, some of them did not have syphilis. They were the control group, okay? They were the group that you compared the, the men who had syphilis to. And also, they were not injected with syphilis. They already had syphilis. They had an early form of syphilis called latent syphilis, L-A-T-E-N-T, -E where you have syphilis, but there are no symptoms, okay? And then um, it was originally supposed to last between six to nine months, the study, which was administered by the U.S. Uh, Department of uh, Public Health. 
it ended up lasting 40 years. It ended up lasting 40 years. So I deal with that whole history and how I was exposed and I deal with the lawsuit that uh, took place afterwards, okay, on behalf of the survivors and their families, things like this, okay? Uh, so you get human guinea pigs, the history of the Tuskegee experiment on the Negro male, Malcolm X 50 years later, why is he still relevant? African-American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, and how elections have consequences. And also the racist history of the white national anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance. The racist history of the white national anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. So, and then you get the Fonza presentation also. So you actually get nine. It's a $48 sale. It's all digital downloads uh, on sale, $30. Uh, so actually a $90 value. All right. Okay. Uh, be sure to listen to the Advocate History Network show Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we have the audio podcast at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Follow us on YouTube, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-E-T-E-P. On YouTube, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. And we put the um, uh, the videos of the shows and some of our broadcastings, like things like this on our YouTube channel also, okay? All right, uh, very briefly here, if we look at some of the history of um, of uh, Madam C.J. Walker and, and Annie Turnbull Malone, and this comes from my presentation uh, from my lecture, Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. Let's pull this up here. Um, okay, that's my aunt. Let's go to uh, Madam C.J. Walker. Okay, so if we look at Annie Termo Malone, she was born in 1869. She was born, now Annie Termo Malone was actually, um, she was actually uh, two years younger than, um, well, I'm sorry, no. She was born uh, 1869. Yeah, she was two years younger than Madam C.J. Walker, okay? She was born in 1869, uh, four years after slavery ended. She was an African-American entrepreneur and philanthropist. Uh, she created, uh, she's credited with creating the black hair care industry. And she was the mentor to uh, Madam C.J. Walker. Now, in the late 1800s, African-American women used soap, goose fat, and heavy oils to straighten their hair. And uh, Annie Turnbull Malone creates a way to straighten the hair without harming it. And she called it the wonderful hair grower, the wonderful hair grower. She's also credited with creating the pressing iron and the, and the hot comb as well, okay, for women. That was not Madam C.J. Walker who did that. That was Annie Turnbull Malone once again, all right? Um, and I also visit uh, the two official websites for Madam C.J. Walker as well, madamcjwalker.com and .net, I think they are. And even there, they, they uh, correctly say that Madam C.J. Walker did not create the uh, hot comb and things like this. Also, when it comes to um, hair relaxer, when it comes to hair relaxers, that was Garrett A. Morgan who is basically credited with creating the hair relaxers, especially for African American women. It was about 1910, because so Garrett, so uh, Garrett Morgan, who created the stoplight and the gas mask, that Garrett Morgan, he owned a tailor shop, okay, and he had uh, a bottle of some chemicals, some chemical concoction or something that he put together, and he left it on the table next to some fabric and it accidentally got knocked over onto the fabric. And he came back and saw that the strands of the fabric were st uh, standing up, okay? Uh, they were straightened. So that's, so coming from that, that's where the uh, hair straightener came from. There was an article I was reading about them, uh, blackinventor.com has an article dealing with uh, 
uh, it, it deals with Garrett A. Morgan and uh, talks talks about that history. Uh, blackinventor.com. I'll see if I can pull it up. But um, visit, let me see, I think it's blackinventor.com. I think it is. Uh, but it's, uh, it, they had an article dealing with uh, Garrett A. Morgan, okay? And they talked about uh, the origins of, of hair straightening. Let's see here. That's invention.com. Okay. Yeah, Black Inventor, blackinventor.com. Okay, Garrett Morgan, let's pull this up. March 23rd, 2012. Um, we'll post this article here. This is one of the ones I have bookmarked. Okay, so they talk about... Um, in 1909, Garrett A. Morgan opened a tailoring shop selling coats, suits, and dresses. While working in this shop, he came upon a, discover, uh, a discovery which brought about his first invention. He noticed that the needle of a sewing machine moved so fast that its friction often scorched the thread of the woolen materials, the wool materials. He thus set out to develop a liquid that will provide a useful polish to the needle, reducing friction. When his wife called him to dinner, he, he whipped the liquid, he wiped the liquid from his hands onto a piece of pony fur cloth, pony fur cloth. When he returned to his workshop, he saw that the fibers of the cloth were now standing straight up. He theorized that the fluid had actually straightened the fibers. In order to confirm his theory, he decided to apply some of the fluid to the hair of a neighbor's dog, uh, an, air, uh, an Airedale, A-I-R-E-D-A-L-E. -A -E. The fluid straightened the dog's hair so much, the neighbor, not recognizing his own pet, chase the animal away. Garrett A. Morgan then decided uh, to try the fluid on himself, okay, to uh, small portions of his hair at first, and then to his entire head. He was successful and had invented the first human hair straightener. He marketed the product under the name uh, uh, G.A. Morgan Hair Refining Cream, G.A. Morgan Hair Refining Cream, and, and, sold, and it was sold by his uh, G.A. Morgan Refining Company, which became a very successful business. In 1912, Garrett A. Morgan developed another invention, much different from his hair straightener. Garrett A. Morgan called it a safety hood and patented it as a breathing device but the world came to know it as a gas mask, okay? So uh, check this out, uh, blackinventor.com, blackinventor.com. Uh, this is about Garrett A. Morgan, and it deals with also uh, him inventing the, uh, the hair straightener by accident, okay? So it wasn't Madam C.J. Walker that invented hair straightening either, okay? That goes, that goes to... Garrett A. Morgan. All right, so very quickly, uh, if we look at, uh, once again, some of the history of uh, Annie Turnbull Malone. Okay, so in the late 1800s, African-American women used goose fat, used soap, goose fat, and heavy oils to straighten their hair. Um, and Annie Turnbull Malone is going to create the wonderful hair grower. All right. Now, during the World's Fair in 1905, uh, sorry, during the World's Fair in 1904, uh, uh, Annie Malone opens up a retail outlet in St. Louis. Because of this success, because of 
this success, she starts a national marketing campaign, a national marketing campaign. She trained employees to go door to door. These are basically almost all African-American females. But she trained employees to go door to door selling products because of a white out or blackout in distribution chains. We could not get distribution for our hair care products, national distribution through the white distribution network. So we can, so we created our own distribution network. By 1910, her distribution was national. Okay. Now, because of a claim again, uh, because of a claim of fraud uh, against Madam C.J. Walker, uh, Annie Malone changes the name of uh, her product to Poro, P-O-R-O, Poro, and her, and she changes the name of her merchandising system also to Poro um, in, in 1906. In 1918, she builds Poro College, P-O-R-O, Poro College, which was valued at more than $1 million. It included an auditorium, a barbershop, classrooms, uh, a chapel, theater, roof garden, training center, and her business office, okay? This is in 1918. This is the same year World War I ended. Uh, this is four years after the movie The Birth of a Nation came out, which debuted February 8th, 1914. This is the year before the uh, uh, Red Summer. We, we had over 25 major race riots in this country, okay? This was uh, three years before the attack on uh, Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, June 1st, 1921. Now, when we look at Madam C.J. Walker, whose name was whose name was actually Sarah Breedlove, she was born in 1867, two years after slavery ended, okay? And 1915, she was named America's first self-made female millionaire, but it was probably Annie Turnbull Malone who was her mentor. And she's going to give self-esteem to African-American women. And uh, at, at the peak of her business, her business earned over $1,000 a day. Now, there's a documentary everybody should check out. It's called $2 and a Dream, $2 and a Dream. It came out in 1986. And it's all about Madam C.J. Walker and her business enterprise, things like this. This is a fantastic documentary. And they, they have actual footage showing uh, her in her business and they show like the fulfillment center where they're filling the orders and they put the orders on the, on the car, the trucks to go out and deliver the products, et cetera. And they had interviews with people who actually knew Madam CJ Walker and worked with her. And they interviewed these sisters who actually worked with her and these sisters were adamant. And they said that Madam CJ Walker was not trying to make African-American women look like white women with straightening their hair. She did, they said that she was just trying to make our hair more manageable and make it beautiful. But they said she was not trying to make uh, our hair look like white women's hair. One, two, um, on the products, the hair was not, the, 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 the um, hair products, they were not promoted as, um, hair straighteners, okay? They were not promoted as hair straightening products also. All right. Let's, let me pull this back up. Okay, and here's a famous uh, Black Heritage stamp of Madam C.J. Walker also. So she marries her first husband at age 14, okay? Her second husband's name was Charles J. Walker which is where the J and the Walker come from in her name. Now, after suffering from a scalp ailment that resulted in her own hair loss, she creates a line of hair care products for African-American women. But this is after she works for Madam C.J. Walker. I mean, this is after she works for Annie Malone. So there's some speculation that, you know, she got at least some information, some, I'm not saying she stole it, but, some type of inspiration or something from Annie Malone also. In 1927, the Walker Center was completed after her death, because she dies in 1919. And uh, the documentary is $2 in a Dream about uh, Madam C.J. Walker. Check that out also, okay? All right, that's just a little background information uh, on them. And she was a philanthropist also. 
uh, Madam C.J. Walker. She also got involved in the anti-lynching campaign as well, okay? She also got involved in the, uh, the anti-lynching uh, movement and campaign as well. All right, so hey, look, we have to get out of here. Uh, be sure to take advantage of the sale that we have going on, uh, the 48 hour sale. Also, you know, we have our online courses, the 10 course online bundle pack. That's on sale $60, regularly uh, $130 and includes uh, my 14 hour, seven session online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school, Ancient Kemet, which is one of the original names for Egypt, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. You can watch from around the world. These are all on demand. Watch at your own pace. The other online classes there as well, including Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. And uh, we have the, uh, okay, so Tiffany, Peyton Rose Beauty Bar. Okay, Peyton Rose Beauty Bar. Okay, so that sounds like a beauty product. So it sounds like you should definitely advertise with the African History Network, Tiffany, uh, and on the African History Network show. Uh, Tamika said, I don't own a business, but if, if I was interested, would someone be able to help come up with creating one? I know I believe in natural hair because uh, I wear locks. I've worn locks for 13 years. Check out Dr. Boyce Watkins, The Black Business School, theblackbusinessschool.com, theblackbusinessschool.com. I know he helps people come up with, you know, create businesses, come up with ideas, things like that. The blackbusinessschool.com, the blackbusinessschool.com. Dr. Boyce Watkins runs that and um, it's online and they have online classes, et cetera. So check that out, the blackbusinessschool.com. Also, everybody read blackenterprise.com, read blackenterprise.com. They have a lot of good information there. My degrees in business administration, and I read blackenterprise.com. Uh, it's a fantastic, um, fantastic publication. Okay. All right. Let's look at some more of your uh, questions or comments. Okay, you could post them here before we get out of here. Um, all right. Let's look at some more of yours. And also you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show uh, or africanhistorynetwork.com if you don't have a PayPal account. You can, um, so if you want to donate $10, 15 25 50 100 you can do that. If you want to set up for a recurring donation, you can do that as well. And uh, let me post the link here because we have the 48-hour uh, sale dealing with the uh, eight-digital download bundle pack on sale for $30. The Black Panther uh, eight-digital download bundle pack, which includes a ninth presentation from me, uh, my Kwanzaa presentation at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. All right, let's see who else we have here. Um, uh, let's see here. I'm trying to get some more of your questions in. Okay, Tamika said, thank you for reading my post. Thank you for the history lesson, good stuff. Uh, Hadassah said, okay. All right, thank you. All right. So, hey, we got to get out of here. Uh, listen to the African History Network show Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. We broadcast here on Facebook Live. Uh, we're on six different podcast platforms. Visit AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Listen to the podcast. Wherever you get your podcast from, search for the African History Network show. African American business owners, email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com to let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network, promote your business, and uh, we can get you uh, up and running today as well. Hey, remember at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, 
and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct for wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Uh, Wakanda forever. And we'll talk to you next time. And uh, Happy New Year. Peace.